So let me get started. Uh, what is the State of the University Address? So what we're going to talk about today are the accomplishments and achievements that we've reached over the past four years. I want to talk about all four years because I think it's been an important period of time in the history of Binghamton University and the State University of New York. We also, though, we want to talk about how we measure success. Uh, certainly you can talk about some statistics, but the measurement of success is very important for a university. We'll then talk about the challenges that we're facing in the future in higher education, but specifically the challenges that New York State has in higher education. And then once you identify the challenges, what are the strategies that you can use to address those challenges, and how do you implement those strategies over the next several years? So let's first begin with the accomplishments. Uh, we've grown, and you can grow and not get better. But growing and getting better was the key to this plan that we started four years ago that we call the Roadmap. We've grown our faculty by 30%, our tenured and tenure track faculty by 30%. We've grown our staff by 15%. We've grown our student enrollment by 15%. And we've added new and we've renovated buildings to increase the square footage on campus by 15%. That's good planning. It's also excellent strategies in order to increase our students' success by hiring more, of our fa more faculty than students percentage-wise. And then what did those growth uh, opportunities give us in terms of progress? Uh, we've added new student success programs that I'll talk about. We've increased significantly our philanthropic support. We've increased the diversity of our faculty, our staff, and our students. We've grown our research. We've had a greater impact in the region. Our visibility and recognition across the entire world has increased. And you see it in the rankings that have come out most recently. I thought it would be useful to use a timeline to talk about things because four years seems like a long time. But when you look back and you say, gee, we did that four years ago, and it took a long time to get to the end of that or get near the end of that, I think it's, it's useful. In 2012, 2013, the first thing that we did when I got here was to, bu to build a process, to build a strategic plan. We called it the roadmap and we launched it. We established the transdisciplinary areas of excellence. These are five faculty research areas that collaborate across disciplines, across departments, and across schools and colleges to work together. The New York SUNY 2020 legislation was passed and that gave us a certain budget for five years called maintenance of effort a tuition policy, they allowed us to grow our enrollment, and we also got funds for a new chemistry and physics building. We created the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and we started the design of the Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences program in 2013. 2013-2014, we started to focus on student learning and student success, and we increased and expanded the role of our Center for Learning and Teaching, appointing James Pitaresi as the director. We expand our Binghamton Scholars Program with the great work of, of Bill, Professor Bill Ziegler from 50 students in 2012 to over 150 freshmen this past year. The Southern Tier Incubator was funded in downtown Binghamton and that construction is almost complete. We hope to be moving in this April. And the new Dickinson community, the new Dickinson community in East Campus housing was finally completed and occupied those years. In 2014 and 2015, the funding was obtained for the Johnson City School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences building, even though we had started to prepare the curriculum two years earlier. Our alumni, through an effort on their own and the Alumni Board Association, launched their first Global Day of Service. Last year, in their second Global Day of Service, over 80, I'm sorry, over 800 volunteers, alumni volunteers across the whole world did service projects in their communities. We launched the Freshman Research Immersion Program, which allows freshman cohorts to work with faculty on individual research projects. And we also obtained external and private funding to modify Old Champlain, one of our residence halls, into a global center on campus. And in 1516, this past year, uh, a big, even though it may seem small, the student wing, it was a huge improvement and expansion of our classroom facilities, adding over 20 classrooms with over 1,000 classroom seats for our students and using the state-of-the-art technology that our faculty and students expect in their classrooms. 
We repurposed, we continued the repurposing of old Dickinson, the buildings on the inside of the brain, moving geography into new, uh, a new office. A mathematics, our alumni center, into one of the buildings. Uh, repurposing old Digman back into a residence hall, moving Harper Advising into old Dickinson buildings, our counseling center, as well as the global center. And also in 2015-16, it's kind of hard to, to remember, but we had this State of the University address a year ago, and at that time, we were just hoping that we would win the Upstate Revitalization Program. And since then, we have won it. And that means that there's a $500 million plus a $2.5 billion match investment that will occur across the southern tier. Specifically for the Binghamton area, we know that Johnson City Health Sciences Campus will be a priority, specifically renovating 48 Corliss to uh, convert it into our Decker School of Nursing building. Uh, the funds necessary for our FlexTech Advanced Microelectronics Manufacturing Center in Endicott, as well as many City of Binghamton downtown improvements, including the incubator. And we'll also see a lot of regional job growth. We're promising 10,000 new jobs in the region, many of which we hope our students, when they graduate, will want to take. Now, measuring things sometimes is boring unless you're an engineer like me and you love to measure things. But sometimes it's a little bit inside baseball. But the reason why it's so important for a university to measure things is that one of the best quotes that I can, I can remember was that corporations, corporations work to maximize financial gain with social constraints. Universities work to maximize social gain with financial constraints. Sounds almost the same, but what we do is much more difficult. Corporation has a bottom line. We have things that are very hard to measure, social gain. So what we have to do is we have to look for metrics that are surrogates for some of these activities or these social gains. And we categorize them underneath our five strategic priorities. And so I'll go through them. Number one is research and creative activities and probably the the, the standard that most universities use, although it's a limited uh, sample pool of faculty, is committed research funds from the federal government and other agencies. And you can see over the past three years a significant growth in committed research funds, almost a 25% growth. But we also have uh, par faculty participation in interdisciplinary activities as well as PhDs awarded. And as we mature over the next couple of years, we'll also be using the academic analytics ranking uh, for a comparison to other universities. In terms of a learning community, probably the most important metric is the graduation rate of our students. And you can see, even though it's modest, it has been steadily increasing over the past couple of years. And in fact, we expect them to increase even more quickly in the future because a lot of the innovations that we've implemented won't see an effect in graduation rate for a couple of years. So you have to look at some other secondary metrics such as the first year retention rate of students, how many students participate in high impact learning experiences such as study abroad and undergraduate research, and where do they go after they graduate to graduate schools and to jobs. And number three, our priority around diversity and inclusion. Our key metric, which will drive many of the other metrics, is the demographics of our faculty and the percent of underrepresented minority on our faculty. And again, you can see that growing. But at the same time, underlay beneath that the fact that we're growing our faculty and the percentage is growing the actual percentage growth of our faculty in underrepresented minorities is 45% over the past four years. And then we look at other metrics such as our student demographics, our students, um, uh, the number of students, percentage of students that receive Pell Grants, uh, also looking at the graduation rate of our students and the students that access our services in the uh, st Students for service, Services for Students with Disabilities office. Number four is our economic impact. Uh, this is our, how we measure our engagement with the community. Uh, as we've been growing over the past couple of years, you can see that Im economic impact climbing a little over $1.4 billion. That's our primary metric and some secondary metrics, looking at students who are participating in the community, as well as people who come to events on our campus. And then the last one, which I think is a very key metric, and you'll, you'll want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this. This is our student 
to tenure track faculty, student to tenure track faculty. Tenure track faculty are full time, they're fully engaged in both research and teaching. And you can see that in the last year it dropped a, a significant amount. And that's because, as I was explaining, we've been growing our faculty faster than our students. Some secondary metrics that we look at for the optimization of our resources as total university revenues, philanthropic support, and campus space. But let me spend a little more time talking about the importance of faculty and the importance of the student to faculty ratio. One of the things that we and, and the provost and I have focused on every year is allocating faculty positions to the different schools and colleges. And you can see a table here that's in a, in a book that you can get on the way out of the number of tenured and tenure track faculty within each one of our schools and colleges and you can see that they're growing steadily across there and that in fact we've gained 136 net new tenured and tenure track faculty since 2011 getting, getting us to 611 of those faculty. These are the faculty who are here doing research with our students, undergraduates and graduate students. These are the ones who are writing textbooks and writing books of their own and articles. These are the ones who are traveling around the world building our reputation. These are the ones who spend a lot of time developing their classes and delivering the best possible classes to our students. And that the growth of our faculty, and I've said this a couple times, the growth of our faculty faster than our student growth is really the reason why all the other achievements on top of getting bigger allowed us to get better at the same time. So, done good for four years. What do you do next? What's coming ahead that could change that? First, some of the global or national issues, cost and student indebtedness. I think we do a great job there when you look at our value and the return on investment that many of the ranking organizations show that we have. There's a focus on completion and careers across the country, and we have to be careful of that because we can't educate students for their first job. We have to educate students for their last job. Campus safety is, I think, a critical, important issue on campus and off campus, and I think we have a great partnership with the city of Binghamton, and we will have with the village of Johnson City in the future when more of our students are living there to make sure that our students are safe. Concept and the issues around diversity and inclusion are extremely important and again, I think because we've focused on that as a strategic priority, we're doing well there as also. And we have always been known as a very green campus, energy efficient and a sustainable campus operation. But the next three are the ones that probably could keep us awake a little bit at night. There's a shrinking college age population in the state of New York. New York SUNY 2020 legislation was not approved last year, not re-approved, so it ended. We don't know what they will do this year, but it is also a year where we have a chancellor who is on her last term, that she'll be stepping down at the end of this year and there's a search underway to hire a new chancellor. So when you look at those three, those three things of uncertainty, you wonder, what can we accomplish when there's uncertainty in front of us? Well, let me give some simple strategies that we're going to follow this year. The first is that our undergraduate enrollment will be held constant. Um, I believe that 13,500 undergraduates on our campus is the right number right now. If we were ever to grow our undergraduate population, it would be after the School of Nursing moves to Johnson City. And that won't probably take place in 2018, 2019, after the completion of the, the building project there. So the campus undergraduate enrollment will remain constant. We may actually be able to lower our freshman so class size and still maintain our undergraduate enrollment because our retention rate is going up. We will continue to grow our graduate enrollment though, especially in those areas that our undergraduates are looking for careers in. I call them career-directed master's programs. We have several that are outstanding on this campus, and we're asking and we're encouraging faculty and departments and schools and colleges to bring forward new proposals to create new graduate programs that can be taken by our own undergraduate students or other students from other campuses. It's very important that we expand and leverage external sources of, of funding. Because the state appropriation will be uncertain for the next year at least, maybe more, we have to make sure that we look very carefully at all the external sources of funding, especially our private philanthropy, but also other state, uh, state 
sources of funds such as the Empire State Development Corporation, the Upstate Revitalization Initiative, as well as strategic initiative building projects that the governor would see um, opportunities in for the southern tier. And with our new dean of the nursing school, Mario Ortiz, an outstanding uh, uh, hire for us, we'll be looking at expanding and creating new offerings in the health sciences fields uh, at the graduate level and those that could be um, launched in the Decker School of Nursing in Johnson City. And as I mentioned earlier, we have this concept called transdisciplinary areas of excellence. We have five of them, and we think we need one more, but we don't know where it is. And so Provost Neiman will be organizing a group of faculty this fall to talk about what would be our new transdisciplinary of excellence, certainly being informed by the five that we already have. And then the last one is, is a hard one to really point at specifically, what does that mean? We have to build a collaborative university. I think we are a collaborative university. I think we know how to work well together. We're a young university. We're a small university. We like working together. We have a great family atmosphere on campus. But how do we be more intentional about collaboration? And how do we use that collaboration, which doesn't cost very much other than people's time, to make the university even better? So I'm going to give you some collaboration examples. When I asked for examples, and I, I asked the vice presidents and deans to give me some examples, I got dozens and dozens of examples. But I decided to pick three that show an early stage, a mid-stage, and a late stage collaboration. And ones that are focused on the campus, ones that are focused slightly off campus, and ones that are focused significantly off campus. The first is the Innovation and Design Center. Just last night I had dinner with Dean Dillon and several of our very important alumni in New York City and we talked about the concept of innovation. Innovation is how you take an idea, how do you find an idea that solves an important problem and how do you take that idea to implementation. It could be the design of something that also influences how you take that idea to implementation. But it's something that needs to be experienced as well as taught. And it actually needs a space necessary to do that. So we're going to be working over the next 6 to 12 months, approaching our alumni, looking at external sources of funds to build what we'll call the Innovation Laboratory. It'll be somewhere on campus, centrally located, so that students can have access to lots of other things on campus that can enhance the product or the process or the uh, policy that they design. Our students are some of the smartest students in the world. We know that when you look at all the rankings out there. We have to make them innovative minds. They don't come automatically innovative. And I know that this project will allow us to move the needle on that and perhaps become uh, recognized as, as one of our signatures. The living building at Nuthatch Hollow, if you drive up Bun Hill, about halfway up Bun Hill on the right-hand side, is Nuthatch Hollow, a property that was donated to the university by the Schumann family. It's about 80 acres. It's a beautiful nature preserve. And on that property, we are going to be building a living building. Living buildings are certified by the Living Building Challenge. There are only 11 living buildings in the world right now. They're, they're ultra green, ultra sustainable. They create net positive water, and they create net positive energy. Uh, it will definitely put us on the map in terms of sustainability. But it's a collaborative effort. It needs anthropologists. It needs environmental scientists. It needs planning people. It needs engineers. And it also requires not just our faculty and students, but it requires our staff, our staff in facilities and operations. So this is a great example of not just focusing on the interactions between our academic disciplines, but bringing in those disciplines outside of the academic fields. Our hope is that this project will be completed in 2019 and meet the certification standards. The last one is a big project. We've been working on this for multiple years, and that's the flexible electronics system that we have installed at the Huron campus, the old IBM facility in Endicott. Uh, if you were following the news about a year ago, we announced the, the awarding of a large grant, a $75 million grant of which we are the New York node leader. The collaborations that we have here are extraordinary because they're external to the university and very high quality. Working with faculty and staff from Cornell University, 
Corning Incorporated, General Electric Healthcare, I3 Electronics, and Lockheed Martin. We really believe that this is the kind of collaboration that can build a new economy, especially in the Endicott area. And it's a, it's a great example of how we don't just collaborate on campus, but we collaborate across boundaries to other universities as well as to corporations. So these three examples, one very early stage, one that's within one or two years of, of its being conceived, and one that's been around for multiple years, shows examples of how important it is to collaborate. Collaboration allows us to solve new problems. It allows us to look at problems in a different way, a different perspective depending upon the discipline that you come from. And as I've said, it's almost free. It just requires the time and effort. And I've also seen at Binghamton University an extraordinary interest and desire to collaborate. What we have to do is facilitate it and understand that it's somewhat complex sometimes. So for example, if you were to take a university organizational chart and you put the divisions up at the top, student affairs, research, academic affairs, and operations, and then you were to draw those lines down to their subunits underneath them and you'd see the academic affairs touching all of the schools and colleges that we have and operations pointing to information technology and facilities and the student affairs looking at our Center for Career Professional Development, Residential Life and the Student Association, for example. Underneath that, what we've already created were these five transdisciplinary areas of excellence, sustainable communities, smart energy, health sciences, material and visual worlds, as well as citizenships, rights, and cultural belonging. Those were collaborative efforts from the Office of Research, the Division of Academic Affairs, and every one of the schools and colleges. And you can see those lines coming from the boxes ahead of them. Underneath that, then, the schools, the colleges, the TAEs start to work together collaboratively as well and start to create programs. So, for example, a program that was started just about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, is the Master of Arts in Applied Liberal Studies. And it's a collaboration from several offices on campus, including the Center for Career, Career and Professional Development that will help those students find internships, as well as faculty in, involvement from Harper and CCPA. A second one would be the Living Building Project that we've talked about. Uh, and you can see the connectivity to sustainable commun communities and smart energy, as well as the schools and colleges, as well as the facilities office. And then you can go to the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and play the same game, draw those lines from the boxes above to the boxes below, and then the Innovation Center, which would involve School of Management, Harper and Watson, as well as facilities and residential life. And just the last one, that next flex or flex tech uh, Innovation Center in Endicott, again, all the boxes. And then add one more level of complexity, and that's all the external partners that are needed. For example, in the living building, we have external partners of an architecture firm, and two engineering firms, one being led by one of our alumni. So those external partners, which can provide expertise as well as funding and support for these programs are also very important. I think what's the key to take away from this is that collaboration is good, Collaboration is possible across so many dif disciplines at, at Binghamton University and that we have to encourage it and expand it. So what do we do in this year of somewhat uncertainty? Well, we don't sit still. We make sure that we are prepared as soon as the new chancellor is here, as soon as legislation is put in place to tell us how we move from SUNY 2020 to the future. But that in the next six months, we renew the roadmap. Four and a half years ago, uh, not in this building, not in this building, I think we were over in Un Old Union Hall, and we organized 400 people, volunteers, across the university, outside the university, to work on what we called then the roadmap plan. We need to renew it. We need to renew it because I really believe there's so many new people on campus that they should be involved in creating the next five-year plan. So we're going to be looking for new and old members. We're going to be looking at how we can take current the, the current environment, our emphasis on collaboration, and find new ideas that can solve new problems. The timeline is going to be short, even though six months seems like a long time. We'll be forming the teams after today. In fact, if you go to a website right now, binghamton.edu slash roadmap renewal, you can see how you can sign up to be a participant in the roadmap renewal. 
The teams will be launched in December, do most of their work in the spring, and come forward with a final report in April. The key to this is that they will bring forward collaborative projects that will talk about the things that we want to do, what are the things that we are doing now that we want to do better, and how can we make these things happen. And, they, and the emphasis is going to be on collaboration. We'll implement those with our roadmap funds that we reserve each year for projects. But also, at the same time, these projects that will come forward will help us design our next capital campaign, which will be launching in the near future. So it's kind of a time to sit back and get ready for another round of thinking, planning, moving forward. But it's great to know that we've already done so many good things. I love these two quotes. The first one coming from our Middle States Accreditation Review Team. Binghamton is an institution making extraordinary progress all members of the campus community are to be commended for this resentless pursuit of excellence. And the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, William Dudley, probably one of the most influential economic financial persons in the state, said to us in the newspaper, the region is making serious efforts to boost economic growth with Binghamton University playing a key role in fostering local business activity. There's a strong university there that's starting to make a difference. And if you don't believe them, look at the rankings. Forbes magazine, the number eight public university in the country when they looked at best values. And Business Insider looking at all metrics, not just best value metrics, all metrics, all objective me metrics, ranked us number 10 public university in the country. So when I got here and people sort of snickered when I said the premier public university of the 21st century, I think we've made progress toward it towards it, and uh, we just have to climb over nine more to get to number one. So what I want you to do, I want you to think about how you can have an impact on the collaborative ideas that we want to bring forward over this next year. I want you to volunteer for the renewal. On the way out, I want you to take your homework, which is the booklet that describes the presentation that I just gave you today. There's a lot more detail in here. I want you to go to binghamton.edu slash roadmap and read about the accomplishments over the last few years. Look at some of the metrics in more detail that we have there. All those metrics are, are compiled there. And I want you to then go to binghamton.edu slash roadmap renewal and volunteer. And there's also a place in there for you to share an idea that you have with us that you'd like to see implemented. And of course, it's the beginning of the semester, so have a great year. Thank you for coming today.